We thank you, Father, that this prayer we have just sung can and has come true for believers in this room because you have changed our hearts. You have justified us and sanctified us and are continuing to do so by the power of your indwelling spirit. We can offer a sacrifice of praise as sweet incense before the throne because you have ransomed and redeemed us, shed your blood, dear Jesus Christ, to save us. And now it is our joy and privilege there's our great calling forever, Lord, to sing praises to your name and to walk in light of our redemption. Thank you, Lord, that you've risen from the grave. We celebrated this as well recently, and today we are reminded, as we should every Sunday, that we serve a risen Savior who defeated our sin and the consequences, death and judgment on behalf of his own for us forever. And so now, as we assemble in your name, we do so before the throne of grace, entering boldly through Christ our Lord to offer praises that he deserves and to submit ourselves to the authority, proclamation, and equipping of your word that we might be thoroughly, Lord, furnished with every good work, with everything needed for life and godliness, that we might grow in the faith and spread the call of Jesus Christ to others to testify to the Christ alone salvation through the grace that has been given to us that we might share it with others we pray today as well as we gather at your table that you, Lord, would be magnified and that the hearts would be stirred in remembrance, faith, and proclamation of the great price that was paid to secure for yourself a bride, a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to praise forever holy is the Lamb. Now as we turn to your word, I pray that you would open our hearts to receive so that with reverence and comprehension by your spirit, we might have it written on the tables of our hearts and that it might equip us, Lord, to leave this place in a way that would glorify and honor you and spread the knowledge of Christ and grow the kingdom, pushing back the darkness to the praise of Jesus Christ. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. This morning, praise the Lord for the opportunity to open his holy scripture to encourage our souls with these infallible words. I encourage you to do so with me by turning in your scriptures to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And let us consider on this first Sunday of the month our 1 Corinthians series, an installment in the second chapter, the second half, verses 10 through 16. The title of this morning's sermon is The Holy Spirit Difference. Answering the question, what difference does the Holy Spirit make in the life of a believer? Paul answers this, giving us an exposition of the work and person of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Our aim in preaching this morning is to expound and proclaim the person and work of the Spirit in the life of the believer. With that introduction, your Bible and your heart open to 1 Corinthians 2. Would you stand in reverence for the reading of God's Word today? Listen as His Scripture is proclaimed in your ears. This is 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 16. Here is the Word of God. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also... No one comprehends the thoughts of, of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of God. You may be seated. As a contextual note, and to parallel this text with the prophecy of old and to remind ourselves of something from last week, would you turn also with me to Ezekiel 37 as you're able. There was a glorious picture of resurrection prophesied in Ezekiel in this chapter 
where this familiar vision, at least to us as we've studied it recently, <laughs> Valley of Dry Bones is seen in the spiritual eye of the prophet. And he has given instructions to command, the word of God is given to the mouth of his servant, that these bones might live. And then in his vision, there's a rattling and the bones come together. They're stretched with sinew and muscle and skin. And there they are, as, as of yet, still not living, but corporeal form has come together. The material, the matter of the uh, bodies has assembled. And there's one thing that yet remains. And here the Lord commands the prophet to speak to the wind, as it were, that these bones might live, that they might be fully resurrected. We read of this in verses 9 and 10 of Ezekiel 37. Then he said to me, the prophet speaking, that as God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. We referenced for our resurrection message last week that uh, further, uh, a further knowledge or a further uh, reference in this prophecy is that when I raise my people from the dead, then you will know that I am the Lord. And as Jesus Christ himself begins to raise others from the dead, and upon his death in Matthew 27, a mass resurrection occurs, where strangely the tombs are opened and the saints who had been dead for years and ages receive life by this animating force, if you will, the spirit of the living God breathing into the once dead corpses, now visiting people in the city of Jerusalem. And then we talked about the testimony of these events, awakening dead hearts to spiritual new life, including a centurion who confessed in light of the earthquake in these events, truly this is the Son of God, that these were examples of Ezekiel's prophecy coming true. When God moves in such a way as to overturn the curse and miraculously breathe life into what was once dead, you will know that the Lord has visited you. You will know that the sovereign is here, that the creator who breathed life into creation in the first place is now regenerating life by the power of his Holy Spirit. I submit to you in part this morning that this breath that the prophet commanded was a picture of the very spirit of God. And there is further fulfillment of this text on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when a rushing mighty wind filled that upper room and tongues of fire also appeared upon the saints. And that breath of God spoke spiritual life into the first wave of believers. And now, filled with the Spirit, they go forth to proclaim the knowledge of Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected and ascended. And His church by the power of that same breath of the Holy Spirit, is yet proclaiming these words today. Our recent resurrection theme sermon began with Ezekiel's vision in chapter 37, and we've just read a portion of it. It was the breath of God picturing the power and means of the Holy Spirit that breathed life into the dry bones. This is a fitting image to illustrate the difference the Holy Spirit makes in every aspect of the believer's life. Title of this message, The Holy Spirit Difference. What difference does the Holy Spirit make? It's pictured well here. Without Him, we are walking corpses. With Him, we have the breath of God filling us with His Spirit, with faith, with life. We are born again, and we suddenly have an understanding, an appreciation, and a joy of walking in the Spirit and growing in our faith that we did not have before the Holy Spirit made all the difference in our lives. In 2 Corinthians, our text, our primary one today, the Apostle Paul expounds the necessity and the effect of the Holy Spirit on the Christian heart and mind. When the Spirit of God breathes into our understanding, we gain knowledge of the very mind of God. Taking these things together, one commentary, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, provides a complimentary quote in this regard. Quote, Intelligent men may understand the outline of doctrines, but without the Holy Spirit's revelation to the heart, these will be to them a mere outline, a skeleton, correct perhaps, but wanting life. Intelligent men might understand, this commentary says, the outline, you know, that is the formal or technical truth, so to speak, but it's like a skeleton, it's like a lifeless form, correct as far as it goes. But until the breath of the Holy Spirit of God awakens their hearts to connect with this truth, to respond to this truth in the fullness, in its fullness, 
They yet remain dead in their trespasses and sins, wanting life, as this quote says. The test that life provides is illustrated, that is, whether or not the profession of the saints is legit or the profession of Christians, uh, so-called Christians, is legit or not. The test of life is also pictured in a parable in Matthew 13, and you'll remember this. This is the parable of the soils. That is, in time, what is revealed is the nature of our true faith in spite of our profession. In light of this, we see that the difference that the Holy Spirit makes is that He will give us an enduring faith that survives the tests of life, and the Holy Spirit gives us an understanding of the very truths that Paul has proclaimed in the rest of Scripture, and so on and so forth, and we'll touch upon more of this. Suffice it to say, by introduction, let us pray that the Spirit would breathe upon us even today. Through the ministry of His Word, proclaim to you in your hearing today that He would breathe upon us, and more than this, that He would breathe through us, that as we share the faith with, our other, with others, with our families, and so forth, that any dry bones that we have, as in, that we come in contact with in our own hearts that need to be strengthened and encouraged in the faith, or those who are lost yet remaining dead in their trespasses and sins, that we proclaim the truth to, even our children, that these dry bones might live and that they might live eternally. Let me give you an outline uh, to dig into our text a with a little more specificity today. Here's the heading. Paul draws distinctions between the following. In verses 10 and 12, we see him uh, illustrating the difference or proclaiming the difference between the spirit of the world and the spirit from God. The spirit of the world versus the spirit from God. Point number two in verse 13, Paul draws a distinction between human wisdom versus the teaching of the spirit. And number three, Paul uh, illustrates the difference between the natural person versus the spiritual person in verses 14 through 16. So let's can consider our text in light of this this morning. Paul draws distinctions between the spirit of the world versus the spirit from God. Back in our text in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10, in this section, Paul says, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. There you see in verse 12, the distinction between the Spirit who is from God and the Spirit of the world. Setting aside what Paul means by the Spirit of the world for our next point, let us uh, consider this question. What does the Spirit reveal? In verse 10, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. What things? Well, we see a reference to Isaiah 64 in the prior verse, verse 9. Things that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor heart of man imagined, things that God has prepared for those who love Him. Again, we ask, what things? We back up in our text a little bit, and we see reference to what Paul is referring to. Consider verse 7. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages... For our glory, a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. These are the things that are revealed to us by the Spirit. Reminder from a prior message, the Spirit reveals to us wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, but instead an ancient and secret hidden wisdom of God. What is Paul referring to here? Well, the wisdom of God, that is the truth, the teaching teachings of Scripture, the doctrines, what the Bible explains, it's ancient. That is, the thread of truth can be followed through the Scriptures all the way back to the very first gospel, if you will, proclaimed in, pro in prophetic form to the devil himself, when, as we often uh, say, Jesus or the Lord re uh, tells the devil that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head, you will bruise his heel. Here is ancient wisdom, if you will. It is the promise that through the line of Eve, there would one day come a son of man, a savior and a Messiah who would conquer sin and reverse the curse. We also see here in this ancient wisdom 
that this would require a great price. The bruising of the son's heel, so to speak, we understand in time, means that Jesus Christ must, must suffer the wrath of God in order to redeem a people. And that bruised heel, so to speak, took place on the cross. Why just a bruise? Why not a, a mortal wound, ultimately speaking? Although our Savior died, death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. And as we proclaimed last week, he therefore rose from the dead. This is ancient wisdom. There is a chain of redemptive revelation that unfolds gloriously through time and is echoed and reinforced and prefigured, pictured, prophesied, fulfilled, interpreted, applied, and proclaimed all through the ages. This is secret wisdom. This is wisdom that is not revealed, obviously, to the person uh, without the work of the Holy Spirit awakening their hearts to understand. People can assent to the formal truth as that commentary, that quote from the commentary, proclaimed. But before that truth comes alive in their heart and is evidenced by a great change in their entire life and brings them from darkness into light, that is a work of the Holy Spirit. To some degree, then, the truth remains secret to them. What is the secret, the unbeliever might ask, to the enduring joy of the believer? What is the secret of the hope within them? Well, that secret can ultimately only be revealed by the Holy Spirit. There are other things that are revealed in Scripture as a secret. Sometimes used, the term used is mystery. That is, things that become clearer at the appropriate time when God opens up the eyes of the people to see the fullness of what He had prophesied in the past. And as His Word, therefore, the scroll of His decree is unsealed, we see in clearer terms, and we have great benefit in this regard, as we have the fullness of the canon written what God had planned. And this is hidden wisdom as well. Hidden. That is, it requires some digging and some work. The scriptures describe the wisdom of God as treasures that must be mined like gold or silver or precious gems. Or sweet things that require some work to acquire. Like uh, you think of honey and so forth. Psalm 19 describes the wisdom of God in this way. Things that are precious, sweet, resplendent, of enduring quality and value but requires some work, some effort, some discipline of our understanding. This is what study is. This is what spiritual disciplines look like. This is what the purpose of fasting is and other things that we do to quiet our souls from the noise and the distraction and that uh, otherwise surrounds us in a fallen world and to set our mind to dig into the things of God and uh, therefore to acquire this kind of wisdom. These are things that the Holy Spirit reveals. Furthermore, if we go back just a little bit more, we see in chapter 1, verse 30, this summary, four things. He, Christ, is the source of your life in Jesus Christ, or a God the Father, you might say. Let's go to 29. So that no human, human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written... Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So again, we connect this verse to our uh, passage in verse 10, chapter 2. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. To what does Paul refer? Well, certainly these four are a great summary. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption of Jesus Christ. This is what the Spirit reveals. Uh, young people, you should recognize several of these terms because in your study called Bite Size Theology, we've been going over some of these concepts where the definitions of these will help you understand the rest of Scripture. What does it mean that God sanctifies someone? How is that different from justification? Well, as you know, if you recall, justification is to be declared righteous by one who has both the authority and means to do so. So the judge who has paid for your sins declares you innocent because one has died as a substitute in the case of the gospel in your place. Therefore, you are deemed innocent and righteous in his eyes, a forensic or legal declaration. you not guilty. This is justification. Sanctification, on the other hand, is the effect of this, wherein the believer begins to change and conform increasingly so. In his mind, his will, his intentions, his actions, his life choices, and the discernment that he walks in, in order to come into alignment more and more in the practical, everyday uh, events of life with what is true about his soul built upon the Word of God. 
These are things that the Spirit reveals. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and so forth. What Paul is saying in our text today is you will not grasp at the heart level any of these things simply by way of a book, simply by way of reading the Bible, simply by way of your parents' instructions, but ultimately these things are grasped, understood, realized, and take root in the heart of a true believer only by the third person of the Trinity himself, the Holy Spirit of God. And therefore, Paul cites passages like Isaiah 64, to reinforce this point. What no ear has seen, speaking and in this way describing the perception of man, I'm sorry, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Eye, ear, and imagination, referring to the ordinary faculties of man. These are insufficient in our flesh and in our mere humanity as tools of understanding. However, when God sanctifies our spiritual sight, when He opens our spiritual ears, and when He, by His Holy Spirit, touches our imagination, the Word of God comes alive. We realize that we ourselves are sinners, but Jesus Christ is a perfect Savior. We bow the knee sincerely and joyfully, and we respond to the message of the resurrection, for instance, just like the first disciples did on that day in Matthew 28. The stone was rolled away. The angel clothed in pure lightning sat upon it. An earthquake uh, breaking the silence and the power of God blowing back the soldiers. But what was the response of those upon whom the Spirit had breathed, so to speak? What was the uh, response of the two Marys right there at, in witnessing this power and glory? They responded with fear, yes, but not a fear that paralyzed them, that judgment was the only outcome but no, a fear that they were in the presence of something awesome and thank God that He had sanctified them through their belief in His Messiah that they might stand and behold and be welcomed in His favor. Fear and then great joy their sins were atoned for. Worship of Jesus Christ when they came in contact with Him, grabbing His feet as a gesture of submission, thanking the Lord for raising Him from the dead and pledging to Him their undying loyalty. And then a testimony, a confession. Go now, tell my disciples what has happened. This is the response of those who have been moved upon by the Holy Spirit, the person of the Spirit. We go back to uh, 2 Corinthians 2.10, and in verse 11 we read this. For who knows a person's thoughts except the, per the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. This is one of those verses which is a typical Paul form, very profound, but might require a second glance. Let me try to summarize in this way. Paul is saying that to relay thoughts from one person to another requires interpersonal consciousness. That is, a person must share their thoughts with us, otherwise we will not know them. And so, he says, does our understanding of God's mind. Let me further illustrate by uh, something that might be more familiar with our experience. So let's say you have, God forbid, a relative who slips into a comatose state or somebody, you could say, a little less dramatic is sleeping. How do you know what they are thinking? Well, you say, ah, it's really hard to figure out. With the gesture on their faces, they're sleeping. Tell me what their thoughts say. Can I listen closely? Can I put my ear to the ear of the dying man who's not speaking? And can his thoughts transfer into my ear? No, and that doesn't quite work. So you say, let's bring this guy to uh, the hospital. So you go in and you get a CAT scan and you scan that brain. Uh, can we do such a thing? And as if reading a hard drive, you know, plug a wire onto his scalp and then have a printout of everything he was thinking. No, we don't have the technology and I submit to you in some sense we never will because there's a category of issue here. That is to say the human soul and the human brain, while having biological abilities and capacity, it's a tool ultimately and a part of us that is, works in a tandem uh, with our soul, who we are as a person. That is to say, in order to understand what that person is thinking, in order to have contact with his thoughts, a person must share with us what he is thinking. He must relay, he must speak. And so it is with God. That is to say, God as a person, the Holy Spirit, 
must speak to us his thoughts in order for us to comprehend him. It's a pretty deep realization of the necessity of the Trinity and the role of the Trinity in the life of the believer. Uh, another way to say it is how, what difference, answer to the question of, of this message, what difference does the Holy Spirit make? make? All the difference in the world because the Holy Spirit as the third person of God relays the very thoughts of God to us in a way that we can understand and the only way that we can understand. Otherwise, it would be like trying to read the thoughts of someone who was asleep. We would have no access to them. The person of the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential, active, alive, and interactive in the life of a believer. Access to thoughts requires interpersonal consciousness, and therefore, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit himself, reveals the very mind and thoughts of God to us. This is the necessity of the Holy Spirit for us to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then we have the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit reveal? What does he do? And for this, let me cross-reference John 16. So turn there with me if you would. You see, Paul is encouraging the church with the gospel that had been given to him. Jesus' own words had been recorded, and Paul had no doubt uh, been brought up to speed on what Jesus proclaimed during his ministry. And among the messages of Jesus, the testimonies of our Lord and Savior, was the reassurance that we would not be left alone when he ascended before the Father. He says, know that he will leave his Holy Spirit with us. And in John 16, he expounds on this, beginning in verse 7. If I find the right book here, I'm in Luke. Pardon me one moment. Uh, John 16, verse 7. And again, here Jesus expounds upon the ministry of his Holy Spirit. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, capital H, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin. Because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, and you will take what is mine. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is what Paul is saying. The thoughts of God require an interpersonal relationship. The Spirit will glorify Christ, and he will take what is his, the thoughts of God, so to speak, and declare them to you. All that the Father has is mine, 15. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus is explaining the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit's inspiration, there would be no word of God. The Spirit breathed upon the authors of Scripture and wrote it down. Without the Spirit's illumination, there is no faith-level comprehension of the Word of God. Without the Spirit's inspiration, there would be no Word of God. Without the Spirit's illumination, that is revealing that Word to our hearts, there would be no faith-level comprehension of the Word of God. In these verses, Jesus outlines the ministry of the Spirit. It is He who convicts the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. These categories make sense to us when the Spirit brings that conviction. I know that there is a righteous standard before which I am judged guilty. The perfect holiness of the God who spoke this world into existence in the beginning and has revealed His holy character in all His law and word. And before him, I know that I fall short and I deserve his judgment. But I also know that there is hope that that covenant might be restored, that I might have his righteousness by that great exchange of the gospel, wherein Christ's law keeping is counted as my own as I trust him to be my justification and my savior. It is the spirit that convicts the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Furthermore, it is the Spirit who guides us into all truth to understand, as we said before, those ancient, secret, and hidden things. 
the wisdom of God, which comes alive. Have you ever had that experience where you're reading the Word of God and suddenly a light bulb comes on? I love these. I often try to pass them on to you. Sometimes they come through reading, you know, helpful information in another commentary. I'll give you one example because it pertains to the resurrection. I'm sure I've mentioned it probably multiple times before. But you remember in the book of John, I believe, when the disciples are welcomed into the tomb, and there they see the grave clothes of Jesus laying there and an angel at the head and the foot of the place where Jesus lay. I think John Owen was among the first to point out that this is a picture, a fulfillment of what was prefigured in Old Testament worship, uh, actually the Ark of the, uh, on the Ark of the Covenant itself. You had an angel at the head and an angel at the foot, if you will, of the very Ark of the Covenant and what was in the middle. Kids, could you tell us on the Ark of the Covenant, there's something in the middle of two angels. Angel on one side, angel on the other. What's between them? It's called the mer mercy, mercy seat. Thank you, that's correct. So think of this. You have this angel and the angel, and in between the atoning blood would be sprinkled on that mercy seat as a picture, symbolic of the redemption that is necessary to secure the righteousness and the favor and restore the covenant of the people. Then John Owen recognizes that there's fulfillment of this in the tomb itself, where here an angel sits on the foot and an angel at the head of the place where Jesus lay. And what is in between? Yes, the mercy seat. That is the blood of Jesus as his dying body lay in that tomb to make atonement for you and me, satisfied that picture of old and then fulfilled it in the new. Isn't that a glorious picture? And that's one of those things where as you hear it, if the Spirit use, or if the Spirit awakens your heart to realize the power and beauty of that picture revealed, it's one of those moments where the ministry of the Spirit bringing you the knowledge of His Word to lead and guide you into all truth. It's exciting as He awakens these things to your heart. Furthermore, He glorifies the Son, and finally He declares the things of Christ to us. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So when did this come to pass? Jesus said, I will go, I will send. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin. You have many things to say to you, you cannot bear them now. When was the moment when the Holy Spirit came so that things that were cloudy and confusing to the church suddenly became clear? I referenced it once already. There was a great moment that signaled in the history of God's plan for redemption that the Holy Spirit, the Helper, the Illuminator, if you will, the Comforter, the one who would lead, guide, convict, and bring his church into a powerful, uh, bring them a powerful testimony and equip and anoint them for the power of the gospel happened, and that indeed was on the day of Pentecost. And just as a prophet prophesied a rushing mighty wind, the breath of God, and furthermore, images of the Spirit like a tongue of fire, the Spirit is sometimes pictured in these ways, anointed and imbued the early church with the very means to understand and proclaim the gospel and what happened immediately thereafter. I mean, it's just days or hours and the saints go forth and the one time confused, fearful fisherman who denied the Lord three times brings a stirring message which he is willing to suffer and die for, calling people to repentance on the steps of the temple and the Solomon's portico and proclaiming that Jesus Christ is risen and ascended and ruling and reigning. And these men turn the world upside down just a handful with an authoritative proclamation of the truth. What was the difference? What made all the difference? It was Pentecost. It was the breath of God and the dry bones of the yet cloudy understanding of the early believers that gave them clarity, authority, boldness, power, and a convicting word. And the scriptures go on to say that as many as were appointed by God to believe, believed as this message went forth. God is still doing this kind of thing today. As he gives you understanding of the gospel and you share that truth, maybe in basic, very simple terms, and the eyes of your little ones light up as they begin to grow in the knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ, the light, a conviction in light of the word of God, the conviction of their own sins, that is by virtue, once again, of the Holy Spirit. What difference does the Spirit make? Clarity, understanding, boldness, truth. It is the activating and necessary animating force, if you will, although he is a person that indwells his people to bring forth uh, the word of God, even today as he did then. Praise the Lord. So that's the spirit of the world versus the spirit of God. Let's move to point two, as we get bogged down in too much detail and not get through this outline. In verse 13, Paul draws a distinction between human wisdom versus the teachings of the spirit. Human wisdom versus the teachings of the spirit. 
Here, we might ask ourselves, what does he mean by human wisdom? I'll just read the verse again and then we'll expound. And we impart this, Paul says, in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Human wisdom is that which is teachings which are according to the spirit of the world, as we referenced before. Consider uh, verse one or chapter 1, verse 26, as a summary example of the wisdom of human wisdom. He says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And he continues this way. But notice in verse 26, we have three categories of human wisdom, if you will. Worldly standards, uh, the powerful, and those of noble birth, if you will. Worldly standards, today as then, what would this refer to? Human wisdom is that which people rely on for authority and credibility. Credentialing institutions, you know, the university system comes to mind. Where we recognize someone is an expert in something because they've retained a PhD in that particular discipline or academic enterprise. So a lot of times, worldly standards these days, like PhDs, also include accomplishments. The worldly standards of today might be a book written or published. Uh, furthermore, accolades, they're recognized, acknowledged, and rewarded for what they have accomplished in the eyes of our culture. This would be your notoriety test, like uh, New York Times bestseller list or Nobel Prizes. These are worldly standards that we see in our culture today, and Paul was familiar with then. It's things that people rely on to give credibility to their message, or it's things that the world recognizes or values and uh, allows people to gain status over others. That would be worldly standards. Secondly, powerful uh, those who uh, uh, have uh, some influence, authority, power, can exercise might over others. As always, power, since the fall, is a valuable social commodity. Power today, as power was then, is both coveted and feared. Uh, generally speaking, for those walking in the flesh, living their life according to worldly standards, power is something either coveted, I wish I had more, I'm going to try to get it, or feared. Uh, these powerful people can do so much to us, it's really disconcerting. So this is a power that we see um, as uh, one of these elements of human wisdom that was alive and well then. Not many, uh, think of how many even today, questions of motive, you know, why people do what they do, why our government does what it does, why the elite organize themselves as they do so. How many of these motive questions are answered by that one word, power? You hear it all the time. This is human wisdom. In human wisdom, by worldly standards, seeking power, and then thirdly, nobility. Exceptional status by virtue of privilege earned or granted, often by the quote-unquote fates. So um, even today, uh, privileged birth, although in America we fancy ourselves a meritocracy, generally speaking, we still have a sort of fascination with unearned nobility. We think of the Kennedy dynasty and even RFK Jr. and the Kennedy family is running an independent presidential campaign and attracting some attention by virtue of this longstanding family name in American politics, and he's not the only one. Or, you know, recently you read the news and people are endlessly fascinated with the Windsor house, you know, the royal family over in Europe somewhere. Why are, are people uh, fascinated with these kinds of things? Well, it's human wisdom, worldly standards, power, and uh, false sense of nobility. These are the things that captivate the attention. Again, they're coveted and feared by the world around us. But Paul draws a difference between these types of things and the teaching of the Spirit. Human wisdom versus spiritual truths. So in contrast to this, what are the things that Paul reinforces the mind of his hearers? Don't pay attention to these things. Don't place investment and stock in them. Because you see the problem there was they were exalting men like Apollos and Paul and saying, you know, I follow him or I follow Cephas and so forth, and thus getting distracted. To counter this, Paul says, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. 
what are spiritual truths. Teaching relayed, teachings relayed by means of apostolic interpretation. That would be the testimony of the apostles, those who were first commissioned, again, with the authority and the ability to proclaim, interpret, and apply the gospel. These were those inspired to write the New Testament, the authors of Scripture, like Paul, and the other epistles and the gospels, authors. However, the gospel is not just dependent upon the anointing of the messenger, but also, Paul says, is that the gospel is attendant, uh, uh, dependent for it to spread upon the spiritual condition of the hearer. As the Spirit has anointed the apostles to record, interpret, and apply the teachings, the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that same Spirit also awakens hearts to receive it, fertilizes the soil so that the seed might grow and produce fruit 30, 60, and 100-fold, tilling the ground of the missionaries who go before so that when they proclaim the truth, as many who are appointed, as who are appointed, uh, come to the faith. That is, Paul sees his role in ministry as interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Human wisdom versus the teaching of the Spirit. This is so important because the church is always tempted to modify the clarity and foundation of the gospel to sound more impressive to the unregenerate ear, to fallen man ruled by the flesh, whose values are set by human wisdom and calibrated according to culture and not according to the truth. We are not to adulterate, water down, change, modify, compromise the message of truth just because people say they don't understand and unless the Spirit gives them understanding, they in fact won't, or say they're not interested in it and prefer to hear something else. Everybody is fine with Jesus Christ so long as they can manipulate him to be a mascot of their own worldview. But there is only one true Jesus Christ and he is the Jesus Christ revealed in Scripture. And if you preach Jesus Christ only loving, then you run the risk of characterizing him as a, proli uh, as a profligate, uh, uh, one who is not covenantally bound in his love, for instance. Jesus Christ is no philanderer. He loves those who are exclusively his. His love is purchased as an expensive price, and he doesn't love everyone all the time in the same way. Although this is the message that the world, the promiscuity of the love of God, that the unbelieving mind would love to hear because in it there is no conviction of sin. This, in fact, is not the truth. This may have tickled the ears of the Corinthians. It may be what they preferred to hear. But in truth, the message of the gospel is the same, just like Jesus is, our God is, yesterday, today, and forever, and must stick to the spiritual truths and not bow to the pressure of human wisdom. Finally, <clears throat> finally, this morning, Paul draws distinctions between, as we covered, the spirit of the world versus the spirit of God, human wisdom versus the teachings of the spirit, teaching of the spirit, and finally, the natural person versus the spiritual person. 2 Corinthians 2.14, Paul says, The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to, to him, for he is not able to understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. There is a difference between the natural person and the spiritual person. And the Holy Spirit himself makes all the difference between the two. Who is the natural person, according to Paul? Well, a natural person is one, it's a phrase that is akin to the scriptural phrase, living according to the flesh, which Paul uses elsewhere. The natural person, or the person living according to the flesh, is inherently limited because he remains fallen in Adam. We have, the only things we have to work with are the faculties that we are born with, and we are born in sin. The natural person, therefore, all he has to work with is his sensory experience. You know, scientific enterprise comes to mind. And uh, we live in a world where in many sectors, uh, the scientific method is considered the only means, legitimate means to come to absolute truth. But it's inherently limited by those who exercise it as a tool. 
If fallen man can use a scientific enterprise all he wants, and so long as he's limited in his uh, finitude, in his fallenness, it won't ultimately lead him to truth. We have our sensory experience, we have our cognitive function, our mind, we have our capacity for reason. But Paul is saying that all these are categorically insufficient to behold the things of God. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Even a scientist, even an academic, even an expert, even those who are worldly wise, even those of noble birth, even those who are, who are impressive by worldly standards, even those who exercise great power, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Because their sensory experience, their capacity for reason, their cognitive function, just to name three tools of human perception, they are not sufficient to apprehend to understand the things of God. In short, saints, in a word that I hope we all can understand in a sentence, you must be born again. Regeneration, that is born againness, if you will, precedes faith and understanding. A natural person cannot, cannot apprehend the things of God in his unregenerate state. They appear as nothing more than folly and foolishness to him. And the closest he can get without the miracle of new birth might be the so-called Christianity, quote-unquote Christianity of Richard Dawkins. You guys know who Richard Dawkins is? He's prominent, uh, well-respected, influential, new atheist. They used to call the movement. This movement is dying, and uh, it's great to see it's dying gasps as a Christian. Uh, Richard Dawkins wrote a famous book called The God Delusion, where he argued that not only is uh, traditional religion false, but it's also uh, problematic. It's like a pathogen that infects the human mind. He started to roll back his position subtly in some ways. Listen to this. He was in an interview recently, and this is, there's a few quotes from it. He says, I'm not a believer, but there is a distinction between being a believing Christian and a cultural Christian, he added. I love hymns and Christmas carols, and I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos. And I feel that we are in a Christian country. He's from England. In that sense, he says, he would not be happy if, for example, we lost our cathedrals and our beautiful parish churches. He continues, so I call myself a cultural Christian, and I think it would be truly dreadful if we substituted any alternative religion. He goes on to say that living in a culturally Christian country uh, is to be preferred over other cultures, and he says, even though he, he believes this, even though he does not believe a word of the Christian faith. Isn't that interesting? Can you go to heaven as a quote unquote cultural Christian? Unequivocally and absolutely not. The so called Christianity, cultural Christianity of Richard Dawkins, it's classic case of wanting to have his cake and eat it too. He wants the blessings and benefit. He wants the good vibes and sentimental attachment that he feels when he hears those Christmas carols and enters into the hallowed halls of a cathedral. But he doesn't want to bow before the reason those things exist in the first place. He wants all the benefits of a creator, but refuse to submit to his creator, to his creator at this time. You see, he's remaining a rebel, and in some ways almost worse, he's availing himself and now even admitting it of the capital, the social capital that a Christian country might give, but he refuses to acknowledge the source. And until he does, he remains lost and dead in his trespasses and sins. What does Richard Dawkins need? He needs the breath of the Holy Spirit of God to breathe across those dry bones and command them, Lazarus, come forth. And I pray, and I pray that you would pray with me, this fellow's like 82 or something like that, an octogenarian, as they say. He needs the breath of the Spirit of God before it's too late. Wouldn't it be awesome to hear the rattle of bones within Richard Dawkins? Wouldn't it be awesome to hear him get on an interview in the near future and say, I'm unpublishing all my books. Jesus Christ is Lord and King and Savior and Sovereign. I repent of everything I said. I was a fool and my work proves it. Read the Word of God. Don't read Richard Dawkins. Judge my work by him. I was a lost, dead transgressor, a rebel against the Holy God. And I realize now that His grace and mercy it's been so patient with me, and now in my 80s, found my Lord and Savior. This is the difference the Holy Spirit makes. It can turn one who is wise by worldly standards, has power and notoriety, to give him the faith of a little child. I pray it happens before it's too late. The natural person 
versus the spiritual person. Paul draws a distinction between the two. Here's another interesting verse. He says, Paul does, that as a spiritual person, you, believer, you have superior discernment, as you have better thinking abilities than Richard Dawkins. Listen, 15. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. The spiritual person judges all things, but himself is to be judged by no one. What is Paul saying here? Believers, listen, having the advantage of the Holy Spirit. What difference does the Holy Spirit make? Believers having the advantage of the Holy Spirit, they can comprehend. They're equipped to discern the things of the Spirit and the things of the world. Whereas the unbeliever cannot sufficiently comprehend spiritual things and is thereby inherently limited by virtue of the merely fleshly, merely worldly nature of his mindset, his worldview, his experience, and his philosophical categories. As a believer, walking in the Spirit of God, you have the ability to rightly discern and point out the flaws and to proclaim as illegitimate the work of Richard Dawkins. However, without the Spirit of God, that man cannot rightly comprehend the things of God. You see, every true believer knows what it's like to be an unbeliever. They were an unbeliever at one time. However, there is no unbeliever that ultimately can relate to what a believer experiences or understands. The Spirit of God makes all the difference. So this is what Paul is saying. Don't be intimidated by the discernment and the wisdom of the wise and the worldly standards and the notoriety and power of the world in which you live. You have a superior discernment. You have the ability to comprehend, to parse, and to put in its right category the uh, philosophy, the claims, and the teachings of the unbeliever. Meanwhile, he cannot touch you with a 10-foot pole. He is not filled with the Spirit of God, which is a necessarily prerequisite, is a precondition for spiritual understanding. So to strengthen our faith, and also it glorifies God. And what is unique about the believer and his capacity in having the mind of Christ after he comes to the knowledge of the truth. The mind of Christ, Paul closes this chapter with this. He says, For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? Well, let me suggest at least the following, to know the otherwise hidden, as we said, ancient and secret. To know the otherwise hidden or incomprehensible wisdom of God and to know it by means of the Spirit of God to truly and intimately know the Lord, as other writers have said, to think his thoughts after him. Paul teaches that these truths, the word of God, the gospel, the message of the scripture, these truths cannot be sufficiently understood or apprehended. Revealing them uh, uh, short of the spirit of God. We can't fully understand, we can't truly know what the Bible teaches unless the Spirit of God changes our hearts. And when He does, He reveals them to us in such a way that we apprehend them, we know them by the instrument of faith and not merely by the instrument of reason, which alone falls short of the glory of God. When the Spirit awakens your heart to the truth of the gospel, you apprehend what it teaches by the instrument of faith, not just by the instrument of reason. It's like Jameson, Foss, and Brown said, they might understand the technical outline of what the Bible teaches, but it remains just that, a skeleton, dead, until faith enters the human heart. At this point, it might behoove us to know what theologians have recognized, and I affirm this distinction. There are three elements of true faith. Number one is the message of the thing, you know, to understand the information of the gospel. Number two is to affirm that it's true, So Jesus died to save sinners, and, you know, that actually is true. Jesus actually died. Is that sufficient for one to have faith or to be saved? No, there's a third element, and that's trust. You believe it, and you place all of your faith, all of your heart and hopes in that truth. Those are the three elements. You get the information, you have the assent, and the faith. And when that happens, that third category That is the one that the Holy Spirit makes all the difference and is impossible until he's done that miracle. I was talking to my brother Seth, who's here today, about a buddy of his who, Seth is like, it feels like he's so close. He's been sharing the faith with his friend, and we were talking about this, that one day, and I pray this, and we were talking about, like, I just, I pray that this buddy of Seth's one day when he's driving, 
calls Seth or when he, whenever on the phone and says, I can't quite explain it. But when I left to go to the store, I was not a Christian. And now as I return, I absolutely am. God has taken that information. God has taken that knowledge that I know that is true. And he's awakened my soul. And I'm a believer now. And I, when I join you at church and when I feast at the Lord's table, I'm at home. These are my people. This is my family. God's my father. I'm his child. I know very little as far as all the Bible teaches, but I'm excited to learn as the Spirit builds upon this knowledge of my own sin and my Savior to a life of godliness, increasingly so as I walk along my right. Maybe he couldn't say it in any of those words, but as the Spirit awakens the heart, this is what it looks like, and so pray for uh, so that's friend, and pray for those whom you know that feel like they're so close, but there's that one thing, and this is as good as a mile, if you will, that separates them from the ultimate regenerating moment, that miraculous difference that the Holy Spirit makes, that God might give them the gift of faith, and this is not of ourselves, but it's a gift of God, lest we would be able to boast about it. So let us transition to communion as we wrap up this message. Paul draws distinctions between the spirit of the world and the spirit of God. He draws distinction between human wisdom and the teaching of the Spirit, between the natural person and the spiritual person. Someone who is of the Spirit of the world, someone who is, lives their life, organizes their thinking according to human wisdom, who remains natural or in the flesh, cannot comprehend or relate to this feast and what's going on here. On the other hand, though, those whose hearts have been changed, when they approach the Lord's table in the right heart, recognizing its significance, it's a joyful celebration of what they know is theirs in Christ. Have you ever been to an event, like a social situation, maybe invited over to eat somewhere? I think you're like a college student and you um, can't be home for Christmas, so a family takes you in out of the kindness of their heart, and you're there, you're hanging out, you appreciate their kindness and their generosity, but you're not really a family member, you don't get any of the inside jokes, and you're not sure what to talk about. You're an outsider at that feast. And this is what it's like to be an unbeliever in the presence of the Lord's communion table. On the other hand, though, once the Lord changes your heart as we are speaking, you approach the table not as an outsider, but as a child of God. And you do so celebrating with family. You've received the welcoming, adopting arms of your Heavenly Father. And you know that you are loved eternally. And the cost that He paid to secure your adoption is the blood and the body broken and shed of Jesus Christ. Those who have truly experienced the heart-transforming work of the Holy Spirit, they come to the table with having their hearts redeemed in common with their fellow saints, members of the household of God, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And this is sweet fellowship. It glorifies the Lord. It reminds us of what He's done and it's a meal that we share in common with all who have experienced that life-transforming work. So if you join us today at this table, you welcome, you are welcomed by the open arms of Jesus Christ if you have repented of your sins. If He has sparked that faith in your heart, you have confessed them and turned to Him as your Savior and Lord. If you have, and in, if your heart is in the right place, then you have immediate from the first day that you made that profession of faith, you have immediate, substantial, and enduring fellowship with Jesus, praise His name, and His people, binding you in sweet fellowship and communion together. In a moment, we'll pray and transition. And as we do so, remember these things, the great cost that was paid to secure your salvation. Oh Lord, we thank you for the message of the gospel both proclaimed in the words that Paul has given us in 1 Corinthians, the rest of Scripture, and also pictured in the elements that are before us today. We pray that as we approach this table, we do so in reverence and fear, in thankfulness and joy, by modeling the response, paralleling, Lord, sharing the response of the early disciples, who with fear and joy and worship and testimony clung to the risen Savior, and then proclaimed him upon his ascension and dwelt by his Holy Spirit, telling the truth to all who'd listen. But I pray that that same Spirit would use the means of grace, his word proclaimed at his table, the fellowship, the prayers, the worship of the saints today, to strengthen and equip and breathe upon us that these dry bones might live and live more still to proclaim the knowledge of Jesus Christ to all who we come in contact with. If there are any in the hearing of this message who are yet dry bones across that Killing, across the killing fields of sin, so to speak. 
I pray that you would use the proclamation of your word to breathe life into them, that they might live and join us at this feast, proclaiming Christ alone as my Savior and Sovereign. In his holy name we pray. Amen.